In the mid-1920s, a filmmaker called Claude Fries Green shot a series of films in pioneering colour, recording a journey through Britain from Land's End to John O'Groats. I'm retracing Claude's journey to see what has changed in Britain during the last 80 years and perhaps more intriguingly to see what remains the same. There's also a bit of a detective story, a quest for knowledge, because very little is known about this archive and about the people that appear in it. And very little is known about Claude himself. In the last film, I drove the first leg of Claude's journey from Cornwall through the West Country to Devon and Somerset. This week, I pick up the route in Gloucestershire, travel to the industrial heartland of Wales, through the Midlands and on to Lancashire and Cumbria. And along the way, I'll be meeting a couple of people who actually appear in the films and are seeing themselves as children, vividly in colour, 80 years later. That's me. That That's... one. That's my brother Dick. Dick. He was my favourite of the lot. The first stop on my journey is in Gloucestershire. Claude stopped here in Sirencester at the Bathurst estate to film one of his most picturesque subjects, agriculture. The farming methods in Claude's film have completely disappeared. Where there are four men with teams of working animals, now there will be one man and a combine harvester. However, the Bathurst family still owns the estate which Claude filmed on. I met Lord Apsley, the current heir, to see if he could help. What I've got here is some very interesting archive of the estate in the mid-1920s, and it shows a team, or two teams actually, of oxen at work. I might certainly be able to help you out with the location, but yeah. as far as the animals go, I doubt that I'll be able to help you out with that. <laughs> I but that. I do know somebody who may well be able to help out with you. He's the son of the man that did drive oh, the oxen. Oh, excellent. Shall we go on down and see Absolutely. if he's... Absolutely. Right, Thank you very just much. down this street. Oh, so. a very very interesting street, this one, anyway. Beautiful street. Oh, good evening. Good evening, Can I help Ralph. you? Well, um, this chapter... Oh, Lord Oxley, <laughs> right? Hello, good afternoon, Ralph, Lord Oxley. Ralph, good to see you. Yeah. I'm Dan, how do you Crookshire. do? I've come to show you something. Oh, good. If, do you if, want to come in? Yes, please. Come, come on, come in. Do you want to come in, my lord? Thank you, Ralph. Come on in. Here you go. I've got this film. I'd like to show it to you, sort of understand what's going on. It's rather remarkable, actually. See if you can help me identify the scene that's about to unfold. Now, what about this? A team of oxen in the mid twenties. Yes. A chap coming in here. Yeah. That looks like. That looks like my dad actually. Does it? I'll stop it again. So that could be your father. Yeah, because he would have been about that age, you see. That looks like Fred Kent, and God have knows who that is up Lost there. Him. So what earth does it feel like suddenly seeing your father as a young man <laughs> moving in colour? Yeah. What does it feel like to see that suddenly? Well, it's astounding, isn't it, because... See, so he wouldn't be very old, would he? My God, I think you're right. Oh. There's something in it there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... So your father worked for Team of Oxen, did he? Good God, Jesse. Uh, wow. He started on the estate when he was 12 years old. Good heavens. And the farm manager said, would you like to work with animals? And my dad said, yes, I would. He said, well, just 
not go back to school or put the right with authority. So after 12 years, he started on the estate. Okay, but these yeah. blokes, all these chaps, they are very big, but yeah. they could live a sack of two and a half on the right. way to corn on their shoulders. Right. So can but I ask we you, couldn't do it today. Did you like oxen? Oh, yeah, of course, I, I like all animals, but I didn't want to work with them. That's Prince with a big orange look. That's Darling there. My dad used to lift me up on his back and give me a ride. I can see that Claude rather liked oxen because he shoots an awful lot of them. I mean, lots yeah. of different views. I can't pick up where that field is on this particular film. Now, here we go. This is like... Now, that's country. more like it. I reckon that is what is now the middle polo field. It mm. was made a polo field when Lady Apsley formed Sarcester Park Polo Club again. Do you reckon that's a polo field, as is now? Well, I'm, I'm not absolutely certain, but Ralph was there during that time. But how's it compare with 80 years ago? Um, it's changed enormously. Yes. And I think that when one looks at it, the estate, there were so many people dependent upon the estate for a living. There were many people, Ralph, yeah. who was born on the estate, his father worked on the estate for 49 years, and um, it was an entire life. And many of the cottages on the estate were lived in by people actually working on the ground, whereas that is no longer the case. The in-hand farm has got bigger yeah. and fewer people working it. While Britain looked like a prosperous rural country, agriculture had actually been in decline since the middle of the 19th century. Since the 1920s, the number of farmers in Britain has fallen by a further two-thirds. Claude was very keen on depicting Britain as a rural idyll. This shot is clearly set up. No one in their right mind will stand so close to each other using a sickle and scythe to trim a hedge. Claude's journey on the open road offered lots of opportunities to show off his all new colour process. There's a rainbow round my shoulder and a sky of blue above. Oh, the sun shines bright, the world's all right cause I... There have been other films in colour before this, but Claude was the first system that, in theory, would be available to all cinemas worldwide. The world at this time was silent and in black and white. The attempt to perfect moving pictures in colour was an obsession that was to dominate the Freeze Green family. Claude's father, William Freeze Green, was the pioneering filmmaker who had dedicated his life and all of his family money to developing colour film. Seen here with Claude, his father's biocolour system was beaten to it by a rival, Kinemacolour. A legal battle ensued, which Kinemacolour lost, but William's experiments with colour were halted by the First World War. Claude's own experiences of fighting on the front line of the Battle of the Somme would have a deep and long-lasting effect. When his father died in 1921, he took on the job of perfecting the new colour system. The open road films are a highly romantic, patriotic vision of Britain. They are Claude's portrait of a country still coming to terms with the recent trauma of war. Here's Claude himself demonstrating his red-green colour process, and in particular, the fringing problems associated with movement. In front of me is Claude's own camera. It's the camera on which he filmed the open road. Pretty well a standard camera for the period, but there's a major adaption for Claude. This circular area here was to contain a disc rather like this. The disc had two filters, a red one and a yellowy green one. As it spins, the film absorbs the red light and the blue-green light. The black and white positive print was then dyed red and blue-green on alternate frames. And when projected at a fast speed, created the illusion of colour. Like the version of the open road we are looking at was carefully preserved, restored and printed from Claude's original negatives by the British Film Institute. Inadvertently, Claude's films are a documentary of Britain in the mid-1920s in glorious colour. Some 15 years before the famous Technicolor films, Gone with the Wind and The Wizards of Oz. 
we pick up Claude's journey in Raglan, across the border in Wales. Everywhere he went, Claude charmed people into appearing in his films, like this couple visiting the ancient castle. Then, having a picnic right by the side of an A-road was much safer than it would be today, and it was also quite a pleasant thing to do. Claude artfully arranged this colourful scene with one of the women dressed almost entirely in red, eating tomatoes with oranges for pudding. These women, who were sitting by their cars enjoying their lunch, had a very newfound sense of freedom. Women learned to drive during the First World War while their men were away fighting. The war was a terrible but strangely liberating time for women because they got the opportunity to do all manner of new things. They gained a new sense of independence. And of course, in 1918, women got the vote. The only women aged 30 or above. For women, it was a truly exciting time to be alive. The end of Edwardian strictures brought the liberation of the 1920s. More women were working in service and clerical jobs. Fashion went through huge changes as well, with short bobbed hair, cloche hats, loose dresses, and no corsets. Claude had a real eye for the ladies. There are noticeably more women than men in his films. Dressed in the new brightly coloured fabrics, they showed off his colour process beautifully. She's gone, eyes of blue, I never cared for eyes of blue, but she's gone, eyes of blue, and that's my weakness now. On to Tintin Abbey for a traditional touristic view. Although he clearly had a problem with his image, the colour flickered. In Chepstow, we find two of Claude's favourite subjects, children and animals. This little boy is sitting on a broken bicycle frame, sharing his jam sandwich with a friend. The range and choice of subjects Claude filmed varies greatly in the open road. Here in Cardiff, he seemed to shoot as much going on as he could. He even made the effort to get on the top deck of a tram to film the high street. Claude's captions were used to guide his audience on his tour. They ranged from the purely descriptive to the not very funny to the mildly offensive. The next films of Cardiff are a seemingly random collection. Some boys in the distance playing football in a park. A little boy in a red shirt a sailor with a pram and then what looks like two professional footballers but not the match itself. I've come to the Cardiff City football ground Ninian Park to talk to their club historian Richard Shepherd. So he had his title saying one afternoon at a football match we meet a gentleman from Birmingham he is a captain and his name is Tremling do you know him? Do well, you know him? <laughs> well, I know who Tramelling was, and he wasn't the captain of oh. Birmingham. He was the goalkeeper, but the captain is shown, and the captain, in fact, is Frank Womack. So, OK, so this, this is Womack. This is Womack. So, so he shows the wrong chap here. Yeah, so, so perhaps, 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 perhaps uh, huh. Claude wasn't a, a football expert. Or um, didn't take notes. Another famous yeah, captain. Yeah, this is the captain of Cardiff, Fred Keener. He's got him down as Frank Keener, who's uh, well, probably the best-known Welsh international of the time, even though... Uh, Claude called him Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Bad luck, Claude. You've got to get everything right. We'll excuse him that. So what date do you think this is from the internal evidence, so to speak? Well, having, having uh, looked at most of the film, uh, I can pretty well say it's February 1926. No, OK. Now, why, 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 how, how so precise? Uh, because I looked up uh, the reports of Cardiff-Birmingham matches in that period, and uh, Cardiff did play Birmingham in February 1926, and from other pieces of information on the film, uh, yes. that, that's when I think it was. And this, this, this caption says, one little chap in Cardiff is starting very early. I'm 99.9% .9 certain that that is Tommy Ferguson, and he was the son 
of the Cardiff City Centre forward Huey Ferguson, who came to Cardiff City from Motherwell in November 1925 for a then large fee of £5,000. And uh, Huey Ferguson went on to score Cardiff's winning goal in the FA Cup final in 1927. Good heavens, so Tommy Ferguson, the little chap here, looks about, I don't know, what, two or two, so? Two, two and a half. He's still very much uh, alive. Alive? What's it like to see yourself suddenly in colour as a, as a, as a child? Yeah it's, yeah, it's quite strange, isn't it? <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. You sort of been frowning a bit there. Frowning, which my mother often told me about this frown. I need to get rid of that frown. Smile more. Of course, one's trying to work out what's going on. And I imagine that at this point, Claude was telling you what to do. He must have been yeah. saying, move left, move mm -hmm. right, because you seem to be to respond to some instructions. You look a bit perplexed, actually. Exactly. I just want to say it. <laughs> yeah. What do you feel? Do you feel he's a stranger to you now? Or do you do somehow... Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah. Obviously, he's got to be a stranger, but probably some of the mannerisms, when you see him moving, I still have these mannerisms and still move that yeah. same way. And, and the, the, the sort of a eyebrows down. Yes, I'm slightly puzzled. I'm quite sure the park that where this film was made, we stayed only what, 50, 100 yards from it. Right. And the, I would be in that park every day with a ball. And you were talking about two, two years old, something like that there? Two, I would be two at that time, yes. Th th this is most of the team. I Cardiff don't know exactly team. where they were going in this car or whatever, but they're in the car and I'm the, the, the one who's obviously not in the team. <laughs> there you are, the, yes, yeah. yes. That, that's my dad there. That's with your father, with the yeah. Paint. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, being a footballer and having a young lad in the family he would want me to get a kick at a ball. Absolutely. Too. And here you are kicking it around. And yeah. you, I see you, and it's only two years old, so it's hard uh, to have a memory stretching back. But if you dig really deep in, uh, into your memory, you can't uh, picture this gun of guy with a big tripod doing this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you were talking about 79 years, so. <laughs> Very exciting for me to also, by the way, because you're the first person I've met in the flesh who's in Claude's film. So it's yeah. uh, amazing, you know, it's sort of just it's an incredible link. I've been studying this archive for months and months, and now to meet somebody actually is in it, it's incredibly interesting. Strange, it all sort of makes it now seem so, so recent. It's, you know, it's now sometimes a distant world, isn't it? A disappeared, lost world of 1920s. But now with you here, it all seems like yesterday. It's a long time. <laughs> It's rag week in Cardiff, and the colour and hijinks of the university students proved very tempting for Claude, including single-sex dancing, geisha girls, and his usual penchant for redheads. Rag Week is a week-long series of events organised to raise money for charity. The idea seemed to have originated around 1900 in a rather peculiar way, with students getting hold of old rags and writing poems on the rags and selling the rags to, to make money. Most bizarre, certainly though, judged by Claude's film. By the mid-1920s, the main event of a Rag Week was for the students to dress up in outlandish bizarre and rather daring costumes. The students gathered on the lawn in front of the main university building. Claude featured the girl wearing a red and green scarf, of course. The pirate or gypsy look seems to be popular, especially with what looks like boot polish on their faces. We Moderns, perhaps a nod to the title of a popular American film from 1925, a morality tale set in London by a flapper who falls for a married man. The only male student Claude selected to film is wearing makeup, earrings, and a mini boater. Claude's next stop is Cardiff Castle, where he spotted a little girl in one of his favourite colours and some peacocks displaying one of his other favourites.
The aristocrat who owned Cardiff Castle was the Marquis of Butte. When Claude came calling, the fourth Marquis was not in residence. Fears of industrial unrest had caused many of the most wealthy to flee to Europe at this time. So his staff had been left to look after the castle. Perhaps his little girl was one of their children. Unfortunately, the household records of this time have been lost, so we may never know who she is. Back in the 18th century, Lord Mount Stuart, who became the first Marquis of Butte, had acquired several estates and the family had a huge influence over South Wales and the city of Cardiff. When the coal industry took off, the family built the Gamorgan Canal from Cardiff to Merthyr. This shot shows a barge laden with fuel briquettes on its way to the Butte docks. The second Marquis had built the docks in the early 1800s, and by the time Claude filmed, it had become the biggest and most prosperous in the world. In the foreground of this shot, you can see coal, which will have come from the mines via the canal to the docks. While the timber being unloaded has been imported from the Baltic for pit props, ready to be taken back to the coal mine in Glamorganshire. I'm now heading north of Cardiff, where Claude filmed the valleys of Mountain Ash and Abba Cannon. This is the road Claude would have used, but it's been abandoned since the 1970s, now overgrown and forgotten, rather hard to find. The new road is down below me. You can hear the traffic thundering along. I guess Claude would have driven here and parked his great Vauxhall Tourer about here, got his heavy camera equipment out, the tripod set up about here, and filmed the view across the valley. Another example of this of the way Claude didn't like to venture too far from the car with his heavy equipment. I discussed Claude's films with Brian Davis, the curator of the Pontypris Museum. It's the landscape that I remember in my childhood, so I can recognise every structure uh, in that view. And of course it's unique because there are individual photographs of that scene, but nobody else has taken a panoramic shot like that of a South Wales Valley, which was in its time economically of uh, enormous importance. The collieries were in a row right yeah. down the centre of the valley, between them employing about 5,000 men at the time. For several decades, this was boomtown in a yeah. way. People didn't come here because they were walking into poverty. Yeah. They came here because they were walking into comparative affluence. Wages in the mining towns were much higher than they were in agricultural areas. Yeah. Large numbers of people came here from England, from the English rural counties. There were quite a few from Ireland. There's and a Catholic church here. The Anglican Irish church. came after oh. the famine. Initiative one almost feels things haven't changed, but really it's... Utterly different, isn't it? Now? It is totally different, even in my lifetime. The most obvious difference, superficially, to be honest, is the sound of the place. The absence of certain sounds. The day was punctuated by blasts from the colliery hooter, starting at half past five in the morning. Well, we get the chaps up, say half right. past five to get you up, half past six to tell you that the men had started to go down, seven o'clock to tell you that if you hadn't got to the pit by then, you could go home. Because, lose a day's wages. Uh, and yeah. lose a day's wages, and so on throughout the day. Interesting, isn't it? But of course, Claude was filming here in early 1920s. Again, by chance, he caught a fantastically interesting moment, because it's just a few months before the general strike, so... He caught the area change. just at the turn. The yeah. peak of coal output and employment was during the First World War. Yeah. From the end of the war onwards, South Wales began to lose its export market. The pressure was on from the coal owners for reductions in wages. Yeah. Unemployment was becoming a serious issue. Right. Nearly every strike in the coal mining industry, contrary to popular mythology, has been against wage reductions, not, not, for, for, wa money. not for wage just, increases. Yeah. Yeah. So people would have been very apprehensive. This was a community that had come into existence because of one industry, and the future of that industry was threatened. All the collieries in a row down there, they've all got utterly different. Claude didn't stop long in the industrial areas of South Wales and Cardiff. He got back on the road 
and drove out of Wales through Monmouthshire to a well-known beauty spot, Simmons Yacht. Claude was a, a clever filmmaker, a bit of an illusionist. He liked to manipulate his material to create the strongest images possible, and quite right too. Also, he liked to add a sort of um, telling details. For example, in his view from here, he has two young ladies. They, of course, were to add a sort of bit of visual interest to improve the view. But uh, they had a rather better view than I've got because in front of me now is a wall built since their time. They'd have seen a lovely view from here right down into the valley towards the river. Claude's picture of Britain was aimed at both the domestic and the American market. His carefully selected picture postcard images, like this of Kern Bridge, shot from Goodrich, and St Margaret's Church at Welsh Bickner, provide us with a documentary record of this country at the time. Claude moved on to ross on wye where he caught the local cows cooling off. As he journeyed through Herefordshire, he came across this gypsy camp. We found Tom Boylan, the grandson of one of these families. Oh, no, here's, now this is a group, group, group of um, women and, and children by, by the cauldron, by the fire. So, yeah. so can you tell me, Tom, about mm. the life the family lived you know, at this time in the mid-1920s? Well, they, they lived in these caravans and they just travelled around the country. They had no permanent home, always oh, no, moving? No, they were always moving, yes. So fully nomadic? But mostly it was in the Herefordshire, Shropshire area. So they had a kind of route, an yeah, annual route? Yeah, they never went out of that area. And, and they, 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 were, they were picking hops in the season for hop picking? Oh, oh yes. And also, otherwise, the rest of the year, what did the family do? Well... <laughs> My grandmother, besides, although she was a gypsy, used to sell rugs from the caravans. Rugs? Yeah. Well, she, that she made or she bought? No, them? no, she bought them from Axminster in Kidderminster. Oh, I see. So she, she, she'd sell those around, around the town she went yeah. to? Yeah, during the outer season, that's what she did. She sold the rugs to, you know, went around the big houses in the country. I country. must say, this is amazing. Yeah, that's my grandmother with the brooch. She always wore black and she always wore a hat. That's, whenever you see her, that's all she wore. As you're wearing black, of course, yeah. with this great big brooch at her throat, and you say you've got yeah, it. I've got it here. What an amazing piece of work. And there it is, a yeah. big round a brooch. And there she is wearing it in yeah. Claude's film. Who is yeah. this? That's her daughter. Her, her daughter? Your yeah. aunt, then? Yeah. Uncle Dick, that was part of his family. This, this, and, this, yeah, yeah, this, and there this, this was another brother called uh, Harry. He had up, he had his family there too. Yeah. They all met up picking, but right. the rest of the year they did their own travelling. They weren't all together all the time. It was just up picking time that they met on this particular up field, and they picked ups together as a big family. Every year they took the caravans, and the grandparents and that slept in the caravans and they took these big, massive tents. The children used to sleep in the tents. But um, what we used to do, we used to get up six o'clock in the morning. We'd have a cooked breakfast. We'd never go around the up fields without a cooked breakfast. Cooked on the sort of campfire in front yeah, of the... Yes, they used to the... cook it up. Claire, Claire, that's the one I showed you in there now, and she did all the cooking. Then she used to fetch the lunch down with sandwiches, cheese, or whatever it was. We'd be in the hot fields about six o'clock at night, half past six. At the weekend the or in the evening, would you go down to the local pub for a drink? And... No, no, they made their own entertainment. In fact, they had a um, these gramophones with the big horns on. One of the 78s, yeah. the records. And they used to be playing those all evening and singing and dancing. And we had a great time. It just yeah. died out now. It isn't any, that isn't like that anymore. Where the heavens are brighter 
And there's a welcome on every smiling face It's home where your cares are made lighter By loved ones you never can replace the open road is a romantic, sentimental portrait of rolling countryside and green fields. He was very taken with the local cattle. Herefords were a famous breed in Britain at the time, but they would go on to dominate the world beef market. The breed was originally exported to the United States in the mid-19th century. They also went to South America, New Zealand, Australia and South Africa. Claude filmed these farm workers taking a well-earned break. The farm is actually Bounds Farm, a cider brewery since 1880. Western organic cider is still brewed on the premises and is exported all over the world. They stopped breeding Herefords in the 1970s, but Claude managed to film one of their prize-winning bulls. Conquest weighed in at two tons and had just come back from being shown at the Three Counties Agricultural Show just outside Hereford. I'm here to meet Mary England, who has lived in the local village of Much Markle for most of her life. Now that looks very much like um, old Jack Trigg, who used to live up on the hill here. Never hardly sober. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I understand. We're well, surrounded by temptation, isn't he? <laughs> but, but absolutely amazing. But how do you recognise him? I mean, he well, was... I mean, I was born here, and then um, these people were around and about then, and. Uh, six years old, I would remember them quite clearly. Well, you know, they're presumably their children, I suppose. You, you, you just simply pass them every day in the village, in part of the village life. What, um, what sort of chap was he, then? I remember on one occasion, we came home on a Saturday evening and we found him hanging in the brook at the bottom of the hill here. So the right. bus driver stopped the bus, picked him up and took him home. That's what, that's what life was like then, yes. Yes. he passed out with what, too much cider. Too much cider, you see, and he got so far in the fresh air and it hit him. So. But cider was a, was a part of ordinary life, I mean, it was a, oh, was yes, a, was a necessary was drink. Drinking, yes. But it gives you energy for work, I suppose. Mm, mm. He seemed to have um, embellished himself with a buttonhole, which is rather charming. But of course, a lot of the old folks did, you know, they picked them as they came through their garden. Which is an old tradition, how very mm. nice. Now, this, this chap, quite different, it's a bowler hat and got a tie on. Yes. So do you know who that might be? Well, I think, I think that is Harry Cox, who used to live up at the Point. Now, on a Saturday afternoon, he and his wife used to come down with a, a horse and wagon, and they used to collect orders from the old pike. People would be there with their orders, and he would, they would go into town and bring them back. Let's go on a bit. There are other couple of chaps. Do you recognise these fellows? Oh, yes, that's John Evans. John Evans, you do recognise him with the John pipe? Evans, yes. And again, yes, he's got a pipe. You, yes, how you, you'd recognise John with his pipe. His son was exactly the same, always had a pipe in his mouth. Oh, look, cheese and onions. That's right. Says, yes. says Claude that's suddenly. Ah. Oh. Yeah, he's peeling his onion there. <laughs> there's, there's cheese, onion, and better. Yes. It's a proper. Plowman's lunch, basically, mm. this is where it all comes from, yes. wrapped in a little handkerchief. And that was the standard. Yes, the they all had their own gardens and they all grew their own onions. And, and does it bring back memories of village life 80 years right, ago? Yes. Everybody turned round and helped their neighbour. If you were short of vegetables in the garden, you did a swap. If you'd got plenty of potatoes, you passed them to your neighbour and they gave you a cabbage in exchange, you know, and things like that. I suppose. The village would have had shops and little industries. Two, we had two, two shops, yes. And a, and a blacksmith, presumably a wheelwright. Yes, we had the blacksmith and the wheelwright, yes. In interesting, yeah. and now, of course, all that's mm, gone, isn't three, it? Still have the three pubs. And still the three pubs. <laughs> <laughs> what is life like for you now in the village? Oh, I don't know half the people. Oh, I don't know half the people. Of course, you see, they're in motor cars. 
you know, driving backwards and forwards, so you don't know them at all. It's so significant that, because you know these people, you recognise yes, them, because yes. they would be, be walking That's by right, them every yes, day. Yes, yes. Simple little thing, but what a difference, yes. Mm, mm. They just simply do get to know people. Yes, yes. It's ironic that the very thing that Claude celebrates in the open road, the motor car, is what has changed the country so completely. There were only 1,200 dedicated petrol stations at this time, but fuel was sold in other outlets like hardware shops, hotels and pubs in two-gallon cans. Because Claude's journey took him to some remote areas, he always carried a spare can of petrol with him. The first petrol stations were only built in 1919, so they were a relatively new phenomenon. The curbside pumps were called ugly and eyesore, unlike, of course, the heavily branded ones we know today. Originally, petrol stations were independently owned, so they stocked a wide variety of petrol, lots of different brands. And they had to really, because certain cars preferred to run on certain types of petrol. Claude's assistant, who's smoking by the way, could have chosen Shell, but it seems the Vauxhall preferred BP. Incredible, this car can drink almost anything now. Leaded petrol originally, but now lead is okay as well. In 1925, there were 600,000 cars in the United Kingdom. Today, there are 25 million. Claude's tour really was quite an adventure for those days. There weren't many cars on the roads, and those cars that were around tended to break down rather often. It wasn't unusual to fail on a hill, rather frightening, so uh, good brakes were absolutely essential. And the roads themselves were very rough, so punctures were common. And to sort of top it all, until 1935, there was no speed limit. Claude continued his journey from Herefordshire through to Shropshire, stopping in Ludlow to film the castle as well as a local blacksmith, capturing the marvel of atmospheric colour in the Dingle Gardens in Shrewsbury. Then on to Market Drayton's High Street to see the milk being delivered and a sunset at Long Mind. From the rural idyls of the border country, he stopped briefly at the Trent Valley and the bleak industrial vista of Stoke-on-Trent. Claude took the opportunity to show off his all-new colour process at Wedgwood's famous Etruria Pottery. He rarely filmed interiors as there wasn't enough light to expose the film properly. But in the Wedgwood factory's enamelling department, his walls of windows gave him ample opportunity and all the light he needed. In the 1920s, there were 735 people employed at Wedgwood. There are now over 2,000, and it's one of the few industrial-scale potteries in Britain. Just along the canal, Claude filmed a boating family who were moving goods along the canals to make a living. The toddler is filthy, covered in coal dust from crawling on the cargo. The public health authority tried to restrict the number of children allowed to live on each boat to three. But larger families simply used two boats or hid any extras on the towpath when the inspectors turned up. Whole families continued to live and work together on boats and barges until the late 1960s. Claude drove north to an entirely different location, Liverpool's docks. This is the Canada Branch Dock No. 1, filmed from the RMS Adriatic, which was owned by the White Star Lion. 
the same company that built the Titanic. The RMS Adriatic was a Royal Mail ship. There was a fledgling air mail service, but 90% of post was still going by sea. The Royal Mail had contracts with travel companies, so along with the post, it took the Adriatic two weeks to transport her 2,800 passengers to New York. The captain was Frank E. Beadnell. His predecessor was E.J. Smith, who in 1912 was promoted to captain the Titanic. It's not an ordinary gal that I love, she was sent to me from heaven above. Next stop, Lancashire, via Southport. My extraordinary gal, she's got a lot of something I crave in her dreamy eyes. I'll tell the world I'm only her slave. How I idolize her personality. Claude stopped on his way to Blackpool in an unnamed Lancashire village. We put a picture in the Lancashire Evening Post to discover its location, and Albert Clayton, a local historian, contacted us to help. I was flabbergasted. I, I thought, what's our house doing in the Lancashire Evening Post? I was born there, yes, in 1938. Then we've got the washing on the hedge, which was quite common. My mother used to, used to do that. And there was an advantage to this because the, the wind blew through the hedge from underneath. And of course it blew on top as well. And in addition to that, the, the clothes didn't blow away. So, so when Claude said this is a common sight in Lancashire, it's right. And this, oh, this yeah. was a common practice. It didn't necessarily yeah. mean that people here couldn't afford a clothesline. They were, you know, they just, this was actually a sensible kind of procedure. It was practical, procedure, you know, yeah. it was just a practical thing. What do you reckon of these children? Can you say anything about them? Well, I don't recognise them. They could have been children who uh, lived across the road or, or next door or wherever. There they are, rocking to and fro. Oh, with a dog, how lovely. Mm. Now, but here, Claude's got another shot and four other children appear standing in front of the same hedge, I, I think, in the same sort of little cobbled path. Do you know who these might be, these children? Uh, well, they are the cross children who lived uh, at the house where I lived. There were seven of them. Seven children? Seven children, yeah. And their father, Thomas, he died in, in February 1919. So at this time, there was eight human mm. beings living in that rather in that small... House, yes. My goodness yeah. me. The one on the left is, is Jim. This chap here, yeah, yes. Yeah. And then there's a, a child there with blonde hair. I don't know who that is. Could be some relation. Yeah. Then there's Grace. The girl here, Yeah, yes. and then Dick, or Richard, on the right-hand side with a cat. No. There was another one called Ewart. Another brother, right. Another brother called Ewart. They're all wearing clogs. Yeah, they, we, we used to wear clogs because across the road was um, a clogger's shop. A chap by the name of George Hill had it, and he actually told me when I was about 15 all about these cross children. And uh, the mother, she died age 40 in 1927. So just a couple of years after this was shot, he knew the family, yeah. Uh, he said it was a very, very sad time. Um, and everybody was really... It affected everybody in the area. Well, Tragic, it really, really was. And are any of them alive, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think Grace is alive, but I've no idea if the others are alive. I don't think they are. I think all of the others will be dead. That's me. That's that one. How many were you? Seven children. And just mother... Dad died just before I was born. Right. He couldn't face looking at me before I came. <laughs> you look the same almost now. <laughs> you do your faces the same. That's you, I know it is, there. That's it, and that's my brother Dick. Dick. He was my favourite of the lot. Oh, and he was a good lad to mother. We've all got our clogs on. You're wearing Nobody clogs. Nobody's socks. Entire little beauty. Yes. You've got the same expression, too. A bit <laughs> mischievous. Here's a little boy, look. We don't yeah. recognise him, but he's eating his jam as well, isn't he? He's having his jam butty. Jam butty. And you're holding his hand. So you must oh, have known so him quite I am. well. No, I hadn't noticed that. So that that's Dick again with this the cat. Is Dick. <laughs> We're very fond of animals. So what's it like now for you to see yourself and your brother as you were 80 years ago in moving colour picture. It must be very strange for you now to see. What do you oh. feel? Does it take you but back? I only remember a black cat. Isn't that funny? But then we must have had a ginger. <laughs> yeah. 
What happened when your mother died? I mean, how did she die? Or... Same as dad, pneumonia. Pneumonia? Well, she hadn't any good food in front of her, you know, to help her. So when she was ill, it ended up like dad. She was wonderful. And how long was it before you were separated from your brothers? I mean, was it quick? Well, immediately Mother died. There was nobody wanted as much. You left the Grand house we'd been Granny born. Granny and, and Grandad never took us in. Who you'd have thought might have done if only one of us. But no, I went to this great aunt's because I'd come in useful for auntie, being a girl, when she was getting older. So that's why. <laughs> Dear Grace, this is from, um, oh, Jim and you, this, this is your brothers. And here it says, Harris Orphanage, yeah, Preston. That's right. It says, hoping you are keeping well and fine. Also wishing you a Merry Christmas and a bright new year. Yeah. Christmas will soon be here, so I hope you will have a jolly time. We both have friends who come to see us on visiting days. Golly. I'm sorry that you cannot come and see us. Oh, auntie will never let me go. Why would your auntie not let you visit your brothers in the orphanage? She didn't understand, did she? She never had children of her own. So I suppose that's had something to do with it. Wishing you a right good Christmas. Yeah. And a bright and happy new year. We remain your loving brothers, Jim, and, and that's Stuart, is it? Stuart, yeah. Did you um, receive other letters from them after this? I don't expect so. Because well, of... Auntie never let me answer. She didn't let you no. answer. She didn't want you writing to your brothers. Why? I don't know what it was. It was just her way. This is very sad. But thank you very much for letting me see that. Oh. It's just been I've very... always kept that one, I don't know why. Well, the fact you've always kept it says Just a lot, something to it? hold on to, isn't it? Yes. Claude motored up the coast road towards the bright lights and pleasures of Blackpool. He arrived to film the North Pier and the world-famous Illuminations. The lights had only just been switched back on after staying dark for the whole of the First World War. Claude's coloured process captured the lights of the scenic railway on the Pleasure Beach, as well as the casino by moonlight. Blackpool had been a major holiday resort since 1900. By the mid-1920s, it was receiving around 7 million visitors a year and had a promenade stretching seven miles. The promenade with its lovely walks and rides, had cost about £1.5 million to create, a lot of money in the 1920s. And all this provided Claude with wonderful opportunities to show his colour process to great advantage. The colourful rides, the visitors, and of course, the Cupid dolls. Cupid dolls were a big thing in the 1920s. They were the Barbie of its generation. The Lawton Dole Company in Blackpool was supposedly producing up to 3,000 of them a day. Originally imported from Germany and Japan, Lawton's undercut the price of the foreign producers and called them perfection itself.
George Valentine Tonner, one of the owners of the QP factory, also ran a number of other concessions at the Pleasure Beach. Originally from Ireland, he emigrated to America, fought in the First World War, traveled to Australia, and in 1920 came back to Blackpool to invest £10,000 in a number of attractions. He also introduced a dodgem ride to Blackpool, the first in Britain. Claude travelled north to the Lake District, the original literary tourist destination. Tourism in the lakes began in the late 18th century, when the first guidebooks were published. Authors like William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge advertised the natural beauty of the area to the nation. Claude's colour process beautifully captures Coniston water and Derwent water in the autumn. He even manages to find two ladies, one in a red coat and the other in bluey green, to enhance his film. The films focus on new outdoor pursuits, which were becoming popular in the 1920s, like climbing and fell walking. One series of films focuses on this group of climbers, and in particular, on the rather bohemian-looking guide. I've come to see Audrey Solkeld, a climbing historian, to see if she could help me identify him. So just sing out if you begin to recognise anything, yes. anyone or particular locations, I suppose. So three people walking, looking around. And this is the guy who um, is the most obvious climber. And he's obviously leading them, he's a guide, so what do you yes. reckon? Somebody said, or oh, could it be Bentley Beath? Um, could it be the um, Continental Guide that was guiding at the time? So then I suddenly remembered the name Jerry Wright. Yeah. Which is Jerry, and why do you think it is him? It's difficult in as much as these two guys are very similar to look at, but the one that we think is Jerry, the one who's obviously showing them around, has mm. a very lean face, yes. pronounced cheekbones, and he mm. didn't publish very many photographs of himself. But there is one of him climbing, which bears a striking resemblance Very to Very much our, so. Our man. Indeed, the same hat almost. So he would have been quite famous locally, Jerry Wright in the Jer mid 20s. Um, yes, I mean, it may be even infamous because I infamous, don't. Infamous, <laughs> <laughs> I think the idea of setting up as a commercial guide um, did offend some of the local climbers. Home climbing quite, wasn't quite a commercial a activity, basically. It was yes, something he, for he the... was offering to guide tourists into the hills. And I think he would have been interested in the whole process oh. and in the filmmaking idea. And yes, it would have suited them both. So, okay, we've got the three people. They're around a, a fire. And what's happening now? They're cooking their own, well, they are, fish. They're fish. Fish from the, ostensibly from the lake. And, um, but now, look, this chap has got some um, sort, of, sort of scarf tied round it's his head. It's got that, a very that? flamboyant scarf. And there, there we are, that's a very good close-up of him. So what about the others then? I mean, any idea who these might be? So this young lady, rather fashionable, mm -hmm. cut to her hair. Well. And um, she's having a drink of a um, mm. well, mountain stream. I feel that if one went long enough, one would find out, yeah. but I haven't found out Well, she may yet. have been a friend of mm. Claude's. I mean, yes. some people even thought it was Chrissy, his wife. No-one mm. knows, of course. We've, mm. and about, of course, now they're all having a cigarette. Yes. Of course, it seems odd to us now, you know, cigarettes not healthy, climbing is healthy. Did the people, would, would it have been odd <laughs> at that time? It wouldn't have been odd at all. Nobody at that time knew that cigarette smoking was unhealthy. Um, everybody, most people did it. So what else does this hobnail boot is wearing? That's not so easy to climb, is it? Rocky, slippery stones with hobnails. Is that well, right? in, in, in those days, there were all sorts of nailing patterns people devised what they thought would be the best way to get a good grip and not yeah. to slip. And it was when the rubber boots came in that people called them the lethal footwear and you can only yeah. use them in dry weather and so British climbers were very cautious and still put their nails around the outside. <laughs> <laughs> and we now come up with, with the climb.
here we go there. Now rope together, so it implies this sort of um, a serious bit of climbing. This, this is Jerry, our leader, and he's belaying the next person out. They're making a bit of a tangle at the rope there. <laughs> He was committed socialist. He didn't think that who a person was or where they were brought up should make any difference to them. If they wanted to climb, they should have the opportunity. He also thought that um, mountaineers had a bond wherever they were. And, um, oh, there they are, admiring the view. This is a lovely shot, isn't it? Yes. There's something rather baffling about all of this. None of it quite fits with Claude's usual style of filming. Typically, he stop his great Vauxhall by the roadside, get out his heavy camera equipment and shoot away. But here, he's um, really, he's properly sort of climbed up this mountain top. How on earth did he bring his equipment up here? The heavy camera, the heavy tripod. Rather amazing, I suppose. He made the most of Jerry and used Jerry's um, maybe student climbers to haul the stuff up. But I tell you what, it's a proper climb. When Claude was filming, of course, most of the Lake District was privately owned. So climbers and guys like Jerry would have to have got permission to climb or walk on the land. A few years after the film was made, conflict between ramblers and landowners led to the mass trespassing movement. In the late 1940s, after lobbying from pressure groups for public access, the post-war Labour government created the national parks of England and Wales. The Lake District became one of the first of these in Britain in 1951. In 2006, Nearly 60% of the land in the Lake District is still in private ownership. So having completed the first two-thirds of Claude's road trip from Land's End to John O'Groats, what do his films reveal? Claude captured by chance Britain at a point of fundamental change. His colour films offer us a wonderful window into a now distant country, our past. In the final programme, we cross the border into Scotland. We find out what happened to Claude and his colour process. And we reach the end of a magical journey. If you'd like to see more of Claude's open road films, then go to bbc.co.uk forward slash history, where you can watch all the archive on broadband.